Today I'd like to talk about uh, fractures in the ankylosed spine. The, um, I, although I run a full elective spine practice and do all manner of elective spine surgery, I also help staff the shock trauma hospital here in Baltimore and more and more we see fractures of patients in the uh, elderly category uh, with spines that are ankylosed and become a very important subject for us and I think it's worth uh, raising awareness. Um, if I can get the slides. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about the differences between ankylosis spondylitis and ISH, which are the two main forms of spinal ankylosis that we see. Uh, we'll talk about the common presentations of spinal fractures in ankylosis, ankylosis spine patients. Uh, and we'll talk about a, an algorithm uh, for workup and treatment of these fractures, um, really concentrating on uh, awareness, uh, high index of suspicion and appropriate management uh, preoperatively. Um, it's important to recognize that, or to recognize these fractures because the downside of missing a fracture is to be catastrophic. These fractures are much more unstable than the typical spine fractures that we see, and they occur with very low energy. Um, so I'll start with just a case presentation because I think that's always very useful. Um, here is a very typical case, a 78-year-old man presents to the emergency room following a ground level fall. I have a history of diabetes and hypertension, but he's been living independently at home on his own, has no previous history of known spine disease. Uh, he comes in and he is motor and sensory intact and has no other injuries as this is a low energy injury. A CT scan is obtained and you can see that he's got a fracture of his spine. Uh, at the T11-12 level, and what's uh, important to understand about this fracture, it's not, a, it's not your typical compression fracture, but you can see that there's a significant subluxation of T11 on T12 because these fractures go all the way through uh, the spine and become unstable um, right there. Uh, so the questions become, you know, what, what else do we want to know, what more imaging might we need, and treat surgically and what else can you do manage. So uh, this is just, this was a, uh, a study, just to put things in perspective, it was, uh, they looked at the nationwide inpatient sample between 2011 and 2000, 2007 and 2011. Um, and so that encompassed 12,400 admissions for ankylosis and spondylitis, of which 267 of those patients died while in hospital. Um, and if you look at the risk factors for death for a patient with ankylosis spondylitis who is admitted to the hospital, clearly the most uh, impressive risk factor is spinal cord injury and a cervical spine fracture. And the odds ratio was over 13. Uh, compare that to the odds ratio of dying from sepsis in the same patient population, seven. Uh, you can spin this the other way, and they looked at 53,000 cervical spine fractures, of those, 408 had ankylosis spondylitis. And in the ankylosis spondylitis group of those C-spine fractures, the, the odds ratio of mortality is 1.6. So either, either you look at all cervical spine fractures, or you look at all ankylosis spondylitis admissions. But either way, uh, cervical fractures or spine fractures in the ankylosis spondylitis population is, is a significant problem with a high rate of mortality. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, as most of you know, is a progressive systemic inflammatory arthritic condition. It affects primarily the axial skeleton. Uh, it affects about 0.1 to 0.3% of the general population. And this is, uh, this picture is a very typical picture, a classic picture of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis because these patients, as their spines ossify, tend to develop progressive kyphosis. And, and Back in the day when we didn't have good anti-inflammatory or uh, you know, inhibitors uh, for the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis, this type of deformity is not uncommon to see. These days, we don't we rarely see this type of severe kyphosis. But the issue with the kyphosis is that when these patients sustain trauma, 
uh, and they or they fall, they have an extension type injury because their spine is already flexed. So the mechanism of injury is almost always in an extension mode uh, in a stiff spine. Uh, uh, age range, the age of onset of ankylosing spondylitis is generally in the early years, uh, usually in the 20s, patients present with uh, classic morning stiffness, which improves with activity, low back pain, uh, limited, ability, limited ability to raise the spine, um, and then the radiologic findings of sit really have joint uh, ankylosis uh, and HLA D27 positivity has been touted as one of the clinical signs, one of the signs to make the diagnosis of ankylosis and spondylitis. Um, the, the diagnosis itself is made through a, a set of criteria, um, and these criteria. Uh, are in patients less than 45 years of age with more than three months of back pain, either synchroiliitis with one of these features or HLA B27 with two of these features. So uh, you can make the diagnosis either way. Uh, and notice in the, in the criteria that you have things like uveitis, psoriasis, and Crohn's disease. So the seronegative spondyloarthropathies fall in the same category. And the, the, the importance of that is that the Type of ankylosis that occurs in the spine in these patients is very similar to the uh, ankylosing spondylitis patients. Here is a typical x ray of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, they, they develop ankylosis of the anterior longitudinal ligament and the uh, disc, um, as well as the posterior facet joints. You can see that the SI joint is completely fused. This is uh, sometimes known as a bamboo spine or a rugger jersey spine because of the stripes of a rugby jersey that you can see between the discs. The disc spaces are relatively spared, although they're ossified. Um, but this leads to a very stiff spine, but also a uh, significant amount of osteoporosis and a very brittle spine uh, at that. Um, it's important to remember that patients can have systemic disease related to their ankylosing spondylitis. Not only do they get peripheral joint arthritis, primarily in the hips, shoulders, uh, but they also can have cardiac disease um, and pulmonary fibrosis. And these things play a, a large role in our management or in our algorithm for managing these patients because uh, their spine fractures often require surgical treatment and we need to try to optimize their cardiopulmonary status prior to surgery so they can tolerate uh, the surgical insult. Uh, again, here's a picture from history of someone with severe kyphosis related to ankylosing spondylitis, and uh, these patients often require a spinal osteotomy to be able to look forward and see straight. Um, that's not uh, really part of the protocol for fractures, but for the chronic management and um, Conventional therapy with NSAIDs and an exercise program start these days. Uh, other secondary agents uh, and biologic agents are, are commonly used to help control the symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis. This syndrome is the other uh, paradigm for the ankylospine. It's somewhat different. Uh, in this syndrome, uh, we see ossification of the ligaments of the spine, but in a much more robust Form. This, is, this does not uh, occur in ankylosing spondylitis. The ossification generally occurs from distal to proximal. The uh, SI joints are involved first, and then it marches up the spine, sparing the C2 uh, articulation. Uh, in Fish syndrome, uh, you see primarily uh, manifestations in the thoracic region, uh, and you get what they call flowing syndesmophytes. These very large osteophytes that, if, if, that look like candle wax dripping, as you can say, uh, across the disc space. We read, again, with relative preservation of the disc space. This is not uh, a small osteophyte that you see with spondylosis. This is a different process. In this, in this time, the, the, the facet joints and the posterior ligaments are not involved, but the ankylosis occurs across the disc space. Um, it can occur in other emphasis uh, around the body. Uh, it's more common in patients over the age of 50 as opposed to uh, 
atherosclerosis spondylitis, which I already addressed earlier, uh, and it's associated with obesity and uh, diabetes. It's an interesting phenomenon really graphically in that the, the osteophytes are almost always on the right side of the spine, and it's felt that the pulsations of the aorta on the left side of the spine actually prevent large osteophytes forming um, in that area. Uh, Resnick's uh, criteria are used to make the diagnosis. Uh, again, you have presence of these flowing calcifications and ossifications along the anal axis, affecting at least four contiguous vertebral bodies, relative preservation of the intervertebral disc height, and absence of the apophyseal joint bony alkalosis or sacroiliac uh, joint involvement. Um, so, if you overall, you can Look at these different syndromes and look at uh, ankylosis spondylitis and compare it to uh, psoriatic or writer syndrome, which are very similar fish. Uh, most of the osteophytes are anterior. Uh, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament is a condition you see commonly uh, in patients of Japanese descent and sometimes in the African American population where the osteophytes occur along the posterior aspect of the cervical spine and can cause myelopathy as they start to compress the spinal cord. And then there is also a, a syndrome of ossification of the ligamentum flavum in the cervical spine which can cause uh, spinal cord compression. But you can see in the disc syndrome, tibosiophytes, they're very large. These can even cause difficulty with dysphagia uh, and interfere with the mechanics of swallowing when they, when they get it to be uh, overly exuberant. This syndrome uh, is a little bit of a controversy in the sense that you don't really, although the, the resonant classification or the resonant criteria are used, different papers that have been published over the years, they use different criteria, three or four um, levels involved, whether there's complete ankylosis or not, whether it's spinal or peripheral. Suffice to say, it, it's not uh, as well defined perhaps as uh, ankylosis spondylitis. Uh, but in general, we have a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, about 7% of men and 4% of women over the age of 30 will present with uh, fish syndrome. Uh, fractures are con but in, in contradistinction of ankylosis spondylitis, fractures in this syndrome tend to occur at the mid body level. So in ankylosis spondylitis, because the osteophytes that cross the disc space are so linear and thin that where the break almost always occurs through the disc, old disc space area, where in this syndrome where the osteophytes are much thicker, the fractures occur through the body uh, of the single body, so they're uh, different in their pattern. But again, uh, the most malignant type of fractures you see are these extension type fractures. The thoracic spine uh, is normally in a kyphotic posture. Uh, and if someone falls and uh, hits their head or is in a car and has the steering wheel hit their spine, there's an extension type moment and the spine will crack through uh, in an extension type pattern, which is different than the typical compression fracture, which is more of a flexion type injury than you commonly see in the elderly. Uh, here's, a, here's a table uh, that just goes through everything we talked about. Uh, comparing dish to ankylosis spondylitis, um, whether or not there is uh, limited mobility, pain, uh, until AB27 is not common in fish population at all. Uh, so there, there, there are different syndromes, despite the fact that they lead to the same outcome often uh, in the spine. Uh, so uh, this, is, this was a meta-analysis looking had spine fractures and they looked at 22 uh, studies and they found the odds ratio of vertebral fractures in ankylosis spondylitis is about almost two, so it's about twice as common as the general population to never suffer a spine fracture. At the same time, there's no increased risk of hip fracture, so it's not, uh, it's not just generalized osteoporosis that causes these cases to fracture, but it's something else about their uh, spine. It's clear that uh, low bone mineral de density in the hip is a factor that's at risk in places people become osteoporotic, but it's more 
then that uh, disease duration and measures of disease intensity um, also play a role in who develops these fractures. If you have uh, some uh, inflammatory bowel problems, those patients also seem to be at more risk for fractures and ankylosing spondylitis. Again, uh, here's another study looking at 292 patients uh, with two-year follow-up, and it's an interesting study because 20% of the fract of the patients in this study had a fracture at baseline when they were first seen, um, and only two were symptomatic. Um, so, not all fractures in ankylosing spondylitis present necessarily with, with symptoms, and patients can um, continue to have fractures during the course of the time which they were studied, uh, and, and the fractures can worsen. But and I put this picture in here to highlight the difference. So in the lower part here, you can see a very typical common compression fracture, which has gone on to healing. And in some sense, these fractures are very much similar to the fractures we see in other elderly patients. So uh, sometimes when patients present with more problematic fractures, we see that they've actually had asymptomatic fractures in the past. And that's just a tribute to the fact that they are osteoporotic. And even in an ankylospine, they can have the typical types of fractures that you see. But in the, the, the problematic fractures are these. So you can see that what happens, we, you know, we talk about this as being like a piece of bamboo or a, if you think of the spine as a ring, right? There's a bony ring surrounding the spinal canal. Between the body and the back is the neural arch. But if this is completely rigid, you can't try to break a pretzel, you know, try to break a pretzel in one place. If you have a rigid ring, it always breaks in multiple places when it breaks. So the fractures are never just through the vertebral body, but they always extend all the way through the spine, the back, and if this section is extremely rigid, and this section is extremely rigid. All the force concentration occurs in the fracture, so there's a great deal of force on the fracture, and these fractures are very, very unstable. Uh, at the same time, they, they generally occur in an area, either the cervical or thoracic region, where we're dealing with spinal cord, as opposed to in the lumbar spine, where we have distal nerve roots only, so the risk for spinal cord damage is significant. Um, Another study from 2017, uh, they looked at over almost 200 patients over 26 years, and they found that 34% of the patients who had cervical spine, who had spinal cord injury with ankylosing spines, were of the patients who presented with spine fractures and an ankylosed spine, almost a third of them presented with spinal cord injury. The interesting or the thing that is really telling is that half of those patients had a delayed presentation. So they had fractured their spine at some point, uh, became symptomatic, but did not come to the hospital uh, until they had had symptoms for some time and, and spinal cord injury began to become more symptomatic. Um, so that many of these patients, you need to know that if patients in this category have any kind of even minimal trauma and come to the uh, emergency room complaining of even any back pain, they need a full evaluation because many of them will develop spinal cord injury on a delayed basis uh, if they're not uh, treated appropriately. Cervical spine fractures certainly uh, were more, had a high ratio, were more risky than other fractures to develop spinal cord injury, and the development of spinal epidural hematoma uh, was a significant risk factor in uh, the development of spinal cord injury. Uh, these fractures, because there's a large bony surface, uh, because there's a good deal of instability, which will shear and rip the epidural venous plexus. Uh, fractures in the ankle of spine have been recognized since the 1970s for having the potential for developing massive epidural venous moments in the absence of any real bony, significant bony looking injury can in and of itself cause massive uh, spinal cord injury. So uh, we need to be very cognizant of that fact. Uh, here is a table that shows or a graph that shows where these fractures occur. Uh, they're much more common in the lower cervical region, 
course, that is problematic because it can be difficult to image the lower cervical spine on x-rays, especially in very kyphotic patients. Um, and you can see that um, if you age A being a complete spinal cord injury, uh, patients who present with severe spinal cord damage have very little chance of regaining neurologic function, whereas patients who are treated when they have mild spinal cord injuries will frequently uh, improve to a point where they're essentially neurologically intact. So we can catch these patients when they're in this in A to B range, and hopefully we can salvage neurologic function. Uh, here's Another study which looked at 900, over 900 patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Average age 68, 85% male, very typical uh, population. And you can see they had a broad range, but most of these patients are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and many of them have multiple medical comorbidities. So uh, this is not a particularly healthy population. Uh, more than half of them had cervical spine fractures. And again, close to a third had spinal cord injury in the cervical region and 16% in the thoracic region. 29% of these patients suffered complications during their hospitalization because they have multiple medical comorbidities uh, and in hospital mortality is 7%. So not an insubstantial complication rate or mortality rate uh, showing once again the severity and the significance of these injuries. Uh, here's another article from the European Spine Journal. They looked at meta-analysis, they looked at both ankylosing spondylitis and dish syndrome uh, patients. Uh, the delay in diagnosis, again, to be highlighted because we don't want this to happen in our emergency. 70% uh, of the ankylosing spondylitis patients, 9% of the dish syndrome patients, uh, high rates of spinal cord injury, 15% in both groups had secondary deterioration. So these patients uh, often deteriorate neurologically even in the hospital um, and uh, mortality significant. It's interesting to note that uh, the patients who are admitted to the hospital uh, who are neurologically intact, uh, about 15% of them will deteriorate neurologically because these patients' fractures are so unstable and even under medical care, it can be very, very difficult to manage them successfully with transfers and, and motion. Uh, to the hospital, to their hospital stay. Uh, this is an interesting study um, because it highlights just how the mechanics of the spine make it it's a difficult group. This, these are 14 patients with this syndrome. It had a, A1 is a compression fracture. A1 is a, is a classification system. It's a simple run of the mill compression fracture, the kind of things we see in patients with uh, non ankylosis spine all the time. And these fractures occurred through non few segments. And so this was a case control study. What is interesting, what they found was that of the patients with this syndrome, a significantly smaller percentage of these patients killed their fractures spontaneously, and more of them went on to malunion than the patients who were not dish syndrome. So even so, so because the mechanics of the spine, the stiffness of the spine concentrates motion at the level of the fracture, it makes it very difficult for these fractures to heal. So even in simple fractures, there's a very high rate of, of non-union. And these fractures, even the simple fractures in these patients may require surgical treatment in order to go on a successful, go on a successful union. Obviously, a uh, high degree of suspicion is necessary to um, make the diagnosis, and um, that's that's the starting point. So hopefully that last section of the talk will have raised your uh, index of suspicion when you see patients in the emergency room or in the office. Um, here was a study out of Scotland. It was retrospective. They had 32 patients, but they found that 60% of patients uh, the fractures were, who had ankylosis spondylitis were not visible on plain radiograph. Because of that problem, 84 percent of them, 84 of them had a delayed presentation, um, and 20 percent of the patients who were neurologically intact had deterioration prior to admission. So here's a very typical uh, kind of a lateral C-spine X-ray you might get in 
Uh, an older gentleman who had a, a, maybe a simple fall at home, uh, may have bumped his head a little bit, and says, oh, my neck, my neck's been bothering me for a few days. Even if the patient can't remember any specific traumatic event. I think anyone who has a spine like this, who has new onset neck pain, deserves a pretty full evaluation uh, because the risks are so high. But if you get a CAT scan, you can see just where his shoulder is, he's got a complete dislocation of his spine. Um, and you can understand what's happening to the spinal cord right through this area. And, and it's just amazing uh, how, how noxious these fractures can look uh, at any given time. Uh, CT scan is the, the, really the diagnostic study of choice. Uh, in this retrospective review of 124 patients, they found that CT scan identified 95% of the injuries. Uh, four of the six injuries identified on MRI scan changed the treatment plan. So overall, MRI only um, changed the treatment plan 3% of the time. CT is, in my mind, a better study in the sense that it really gives us a better sense of the bony anatomy. And when it comes to planning surgical treatment, having good uh, knowledge of the osteology, um, the anatomy uh, helps us to understand what's going on. So um, a routine use of MRI, they recommended a routine, routine use of MRI be limited to patients with non ankylose levels and with the disco ligamentous injury. So we, are, we think they may have broken through a part of their spine that's actually not used. Or in patients who have neurologic deficits that can't be identified by the, by the CT scan. So at times you will see patients whose neurologic deficits do not match the uh, presentation you would expect from the level of the fracture on CT. And those patients certainly could have an MRI scan. Uh, and what you're going to find in many of those patients is a large epidural hematoma. So here's a patient who had a, a fracture down here where there's high signal uh, in the vertebral bodies, but the hematoma is actually tracking up and causing compression. Uh, so in this study, uh, an average age range patient of 70, almost 74, 93% had low velocity injuries. So they're not high energy injuries. Um, but, and, and so type B fractures are, 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 are extension fractures where the spine is cracked but not dislocated. Type C fractures are fractures that are complete dislocations in the spine, but you can see that patients had well, all B and C type injuries, and 30% of those patients had significant epidural hematomas. It may change your surgical management because if you uh, think the fracture is down here and you just fix this region, and don't do anything to evacuate the hematoma, you're not really addressing the cause of the neurologic deficit. Um, I will say that occasionally, if there's a suspicion uh, of a fracture and even the CT scan is a diagnostic, MRI scan will often show uh, changes in the vertebral body uh, that may help us to make the diagnosis. But by and large, CT is the workhorse. This slide may be the most important. Uh, of all, although it, and it's intraoperative, but that's not the point of it. The point of it is this. Um, when these patients are managed in the hospital, you need to pay attention to the fact that their spine was a certain shape pre-injury. And the best way to decompress the spinal canal or preserve neurologic function is to maintain that preoperative deformity um, we've seen multiple patients who come in the hospital sitting up in their bed uh, and we and he asked their family, uh, is this what grandpa normally looks like? And they say, no, he hasn't looked straight ahead for the past 20 years. Um, so, and if you look at his CAT scan or his, or his x-ray at that point, you see he's got a massively extended uh, dislocated or nearly dislocated spine. So as we, so although we are always taught in medical school and in ETLS that patients should be on a flat board and their, their head, you know, they should be strapped down and hold their head still, this is one patient group in which allowing the patient's neck to flex forward and support it in its normal position may be indicated, especially as patients are transported around the hospital, although their, their head needs to be stabilized. We may not wish to stabilize it in 
kind of position which we normally think about for most spine injury patients, but we try to reproduce the normal or the usual position that their head is in in order to keep their spine in appropriate alignment and protect their spinal cord. And this can be very, very challenging, especially in the operating room when we go to position patients for surgery and turn them prone. Uh, you have to come up with all kinds of uh, creative ways of thinking uh, in order to position the patients appropriately uh, in the operating room. So we'll go back to the case that I presented at, at first just to give you another representation or another uh, example of this kind of thing. Here's our 78-year-old man had a low energy ground level fall, uh, came in with this injury, and we recognize that this injury has a subluxation, so there's a dislocation of the spine. This injury travels all the way through the spine. You can see air in the, in the fracture gap indicating that there's instability or motion. Um, no other injuries. This gentleman, uh, despite his age, is clearly indicated for surgical treatment. Um, so we take him to the operating room, um, and we're going to do fixation. So, um, Put him, we bring the operating, we put him on the operating table like this. This is not that particular patient, but it's an example of someone who had the same type of injury. And we and we use um, SSEP and MEP or somatosensory vocal potentials and motor vocal potential myron. We always get baseline signals. We always get a set of vocal potentials prior to the induction of surgery. Uh, many of these patients may have diabetes. They may have peripheral neuropathy, they're elderly, and it's nice to know that you have signals before you flip um, because you have to you want to follow those. And this is the issue. Uh, here's a patient who did, did, did everything we could to position him back into the position that he was preoperatively. So you can see the, the whole he's on a frame that is kyphotic. He let his head fall down, he let his legs fall. We're trying, we're literally trying to flex the spine back to its normal position prior to surgery. And despite that, um, when we position the patient on the table, you can see that the spine extends. There's a subluxation. If you follow the posterior vertebral body line here, there's a step off. So there's dislocating through the fracture gap. When we repeat this before we start the procedure, we, we do a post positioning run of SSCPs and MEPs, uh, and lo and behold, he's lost uh, his motor and sensory low potential. So, a patient, uh, just by virtue of that position, a simple maneuver of turning him prone, we compromise the spinal cord uh, sufficiently uh, to uh, be problematic. So, the patient is. Uh, before we put, and even though we're already prepping, it takes a while to get the keys. We bring them back, we bring the stretcher back in, we take the patient off the table, we put him back into his normal, his other position, or he's laying on his side uh, in a curled position to try to get the spine to go back in position. And uh, we'll try to arrange the table for even more kyphosis change the head positioning, change the leg positioning where we can, and once again, position the patient in order to do the surgery. Uh, eventually, we're able to position the patient prone, and we do a posterior fixation, and you can see here that the spine is now uh, aligned, uh, and the spinal canal is decompressed. And here you get a good sense of how this fracture travels through here and down and ends here. And it's often the case when you get these subluxations that the spinal cord gets pinched between the lamina above or the, or the lamina because the vertebral body moves backwards. So the, this spike of bone impinges on the back of the vertebral body above and the cord gets pinched right in that area. Uh, occasionally, uh, you will lose signals during surgery or it's impossible to position the patient accurately. The thing to do, the thing to do in that situation is very quickly do a very small exposure Put the screws in, just a few screws on one side, get the spine reduced and hold it while we do the rest of the procedure. Uh, in general, we treat fractures with very long constructs, 
because they are because the spine is so stiff and, and ankylosed and they're so osteoporotic you need to get multiple points of fixation both above and below the fracture in order to hold it adequately without because and maintain it in alignment so most of the time these patients get fairly long uh exposures and multiple screws so it's a, that's why i say we need to evaluate the cardiopulmonary function uh pretty uh, aggressively because it's a pretty big surgery uh, but overall three months later this fracture is healed uh, and the patient has done well uh, what is uh, what is new in this situation more and more we're able to do these types of surgeries with percutaneous fixation so instead of making a long incision and exposing the whole spine if we can get the patient positioned appropriately we can put the, the screws in with multiple small stab incisions and then pass the rod in a subfascial plane and that alleviates 90 percent of the surgical wounding um, the surgical time is much shorter because we don't have to do the dissection physiologic burden of surgery is much uh, less so more and more uh, these surgeries get done through a percutaneous type fixation which is efficient uh, and can be done fairly quickly so what do they take? That's really what I have. Uh, and I think that's pretty close to 40 minutes. So I think we're on time. Uh, patients with ankylosing spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis is at high risk for unstable spine fractures and even minimal trauma. So a high, high index of suspicion any patient with this type of an injury who has even minimal trauma, if they present with neck pain or back pain, requires really a full evaluation uh, to make sure we're not missing anything. CT should be our first imaging modality of choice, um, but MRI scan in certain circumstances, especially if there's any indication that there might be uh, an epidural hematoma or unexplained neurologic deficit. The most common fracture patterns are what we call B3, which are extension injuries, uh, where the front of the spine becomes longer and the spine hinges on the back. Uh, or type C, which is spinal dislocations or shearing type injuries. And that's because the spine is so rigid and it's impossible to break just the front and leave the back intact. Um, and uh, just as important as the high index of suspicion, uh, careful patient positioning during uh, the patient's hospitalization to avoid spinal dislocation uh, is uh, crucial. And everyone on the team, the nurses, the physical therapists, everyone needs to understand uh, that these patients uh, are a little different than our typical elderly patients with compression fracture and they need to be treated really with big gloves. We, unfortunately, over the years, I've been at Maryland for almost 20 years, we've seen patients uh, on the floor uh, come in with this type of fracture, waiting surgery the next morning, um, and because of an unrecognized uh, situation, patients have become completely paralyzed um, because their spine uh, dislocated before we could safely get to the operating. So even in, in the best circumstances, in the best trauma places in the country, uh, you still see patients who deteriorate neurologically uh, in a hospital. These are the references that I had.